Please all rise and for the international. I think a, a, a situation which I can really summarize in the following kind of way that uh, capital right now is too big to fail we cannot imagine a situation where we would shut down the flow of capital because if we shut down the flow of capital 80% of the world's population would immediately starve would be rendered immobile uh, would not be able to, 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 to reproduce themselves in very effective ways. So we cannot afford uh, any kind of sustained attack upon capital accumulation. So the kind of fantasy that you might have had, or socialists or communists and so on might have had uh, back in uh, 1850, which is that, well, okay, we can destroy this capitalist system and we can build something entirely different. That is an impossibility right now. We have to keep circulation of capital in, in motion. We have to keep things moving because if we don't do that, uh, we are actually stuck uh, with a situation in which, like as I've said, almost all of us uh, would, would, would starve. And uh, we have to actually uh, spend some time propping it up, trying to reorganize it and, and, and maybe shift it around very slowly and uh, over time. Whether you like it or not, the global economy is the big ocean that you cannot escape from. Any attempt to cut off flows of capital, technologies, products, industries and people between economies and channel the waters in the ocean back into isolated lakes and creeks this is simply not possible, and indeed, it runs counter to the historical trend. Socialism with Chinese characteristics, I, I shortened it to SWCC. It's the official state ideology of the People's Republic of China. And, you know, one could argue that it is the most successful form of real existing socialism to date. It's, it's actually a broad term for the set of political theories and policies that are the product of scientific socialism, representing Marxism, Leninism adapted to Chinese circumstances and specific time periods. This, in a way, it's like a living ideology that's constantly being refined, constantly being updated to adapt to the uh, changing material conditions of the Chinese nation, right? And so, you know, it starts out with Deng Xiaoping theory. It was under, really, under the Deng Xiaoping administration, under his era, that this the term socialism with Chinese characteristics really took off. Right now, of course, we are in the era of Xi Jinping and his contribution to Marxist theory in China is Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. This theory of a primary stage of socialism was eventually developed and used as the theoretical basis for the political report that was delivered to the 13th National Congress held in 1987. And so the theory, what is the main focus, right? As, you know, keep saying it again and again, is to develop the productive forces in China because China was just so poor. By the 80s, the, the socialist mission or the socialist project in Eastern Europe was starting to fail. And I think Chinese leaders, the leadership knew that. And they had to find a way to have socialism succeed in China and not go the way of what happened in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Okay, so this is what Deng Xiaoping said in 1984. What is socialism and what is Marxism? We were not quite clear about this in the past. Marxism attaches utmost importance to developing the productive forces. We have said that socialism is the primary stage of communism and that at the advanced stage, the principle from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs will be applied. This calls for highly developed productive forces 
and an overwhelming abundance of material wealth. Therefore, the fundamental task for the socialist stage is to develop the productive forces. The superiority of the socialist system is demonstrated in the final analysis by faster and greater development of those forces than under the capitalist system. As they develop, the people's material and cultural life will constantly improve. One of our shortcomings after the founding of the People's Republic was that we didn't pay enough attention to developing the productive forces. Socialism means eliminating poverty. And finally, incorporating Chinese characteristics. Confucianism is one of them. And eventually, you know, the party came around and thought, you know, not all aspects of Confucianism are bad. And despite what happened during the Cultural Revolution, you're still not able to get rid of it. It's just, it's so ingrained in the way that Chinese people think and act. So instead of fighting it, why don't we harness it? And that's like a recurring theme of socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? Some things, you, I mean, there's certain core principles you gotta just put your foot down, this is not gonna happen. But a lot of other things, maybe it's more productive to harness it, right? Like harnessing foreign capital, like harnessing market economics, instead of just trying so hard to fight it and keep it out. Then another important philosophy in China is Taoism, right? What are some core principles of Taoism? Compassion, moderation, humility. And the yin yang, the concept of dualism. And then the Confucian concept of Xiao Kang and Da Tong. So Xiao Kang is actually very popular, well, a little less popular now, but very pop. It was popularized by uh, President Hu Jintao during his administration. He said, you know, the the goal, his goal, right, was to create a Xiao Kang society. And what does that mean? It means, you know, lesser prosperity, a moderate, a moderately prosperous society, in which the people are able to live relatively comfortably albeit ordinarily, right? Not super rich, but comfortable. You don't have to worry about being hungry. You don't have to be worried about being sick. You don't have to worry about, you know, putting clothes on your back, a roof on your head, right? That's that's the first main goal, right? Is, is, to, is to get to the Shao Kang society. The concept, again, that dates back to the 11th to 7th century. It first came in the, uh, in the, in the classic of poetry. So thousands of years ago, this concept has been there thousands of years. All right, so what comes after Shao Kang? Well, what comes after Shao Kang is a period called Da Tong, the Great Unity. The way that this concept is presented in the Li Qi is, um, you know, one of Confucius's disciples, right? If you read any of the Confucian classics, it's usually one of his disciples talking to Confucius and you know, getting, trying to get his wisdom. So. This story goes, one of his disciples sees Confucius pacing back and forth very nervously and he asks him why. Well, he's, Confucius responds, well, I don't think I'm going to live to see Datum. I don't think I'm going to live to see the great unity, right? And so his disciple asks him, well, you know, Master, what do you mean by the great unity, right? And this is what he says. When the grand course was pursued, a public and common spirit ruled all under heaven. They chose men of talents, virtue, and ability. Their words were sincere, and what they cultivated was harmony. Thus men did not love their parents only, nor treat only their own sons as their children. A competent provision was secured for the aged, till their death, employment for the able body, and the means of growing up to the young. They showed kindness and compassion to widows, orphans, childless men, and those who were disabled by disease, so that they were all sufficiently maintained. Males had their proper work, and females had their homes. They accumulated articles of value, disliking that they should be thrown away upon the ground, but not wishing to keep them for their own gratification. They labored with their strength, disliking that it should not be exerted, but not exerting it only with a view to their own advantage. In this way, selfish schemings were repressed and found no development. Robbers, thieves, and rebellious traitors did not show themselves, and hence the outer doors remained open and were not shut. This was the period of what we call the Great Unity. So, comrades, like, what does that sound like to you? Right? It sounds like, I mean, does anybody care to? It sounds like ultimate communism, right? It's like, it sounds like the end stage of communism, a paradise on earth. This idea, and of course, Confucius is not the only ancient philosopher to write about the ideal world, right? I mean, a lot of like Plato, a lot of 
a lot of Western philosophers, Middle Eastern philosophers, had the same idea. That has always been the goal. I would argue it's always been the goal of mankind, is to reach this sort of society, right? Where everything is in abundance, people don't have to worry, people treat each other with respect, and you know, that's why they call it the Great Union.